Praise the Lord, welcome to a fresh episode. While we are understanding the end-time prophecies about Islam and Christian eschatology, it is important that we are cognizant about the cosmic conflict which we are also part of. This time, we will start looking at New Testament scriptures in addition to the Old Testament scriptures to study the characteristics of the kingdoms we are affiliated with. This is about the clash of the kingdoms. This is what would happen at the end. The final result is already decided. So sit back and relax. If you happen to be on the wrong side, you can make the switch now. Let me read the final result for you. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Revelation chapter 11 verse 15. Yay! Starting right from the book of Genesis to the last book of Revelation, it is a story of two kingdoms. The clash is between these two kingdoms, the kingdom of God against the kingdom of this world. The Bible uses different synonyms to identify them at different places, but basically there are just two of them. The kingdom of God is a proactive kingdom, whereas the kingdom of this world is a reactive one. We identify the kingdoms based on the positioning of the ideology and its mannerisms. The constitution of the kingdom of God can be found in the Bible. Therefore, once we know the ideology and the mannerisms, we will not have an issue in identifying the kingdom of this world. Both the kingdoms are diametrically opposite to each other. If one stands for truth, the other will stand for lies. If one identifies with love, the other identifies with hate. If one is known for its mercy and compassion, the other is known for its arrogance and violence. The list goes on and on. This conflict must go on till one party annihilates the other one forever. We all are party to this cosmic conflict irrespective of whether we are aware of it or not. We must proactively choose sides. We just cannot remain neutral. Therefore, let us study the origin of this conflict so that we can make an informed decision. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9 says what has been will be again, what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun, let us search the pages of the Bible to know what had happened at the first place and what continues to happen since then till our time. We will go to an event that happened in the past eternity. A passage in Isaiah, and a similar passage in Ezekiel, alludes to an event which happened then. Jesus testified to having watched that event happen. Yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Satan's fall from heaven is symbolically described in Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 to 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 12 to 18. While these two passages are referring specifically to the kings of Babylon and Tyre, we believe they also reference the spiritual power behind those kings, namely Satan. We know that the angels were created before the earth as we read in Job chapter 38 verses 4 to 7. Satan fell before he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden. We can read it in Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 to 14. Satan's fall, therefore, must have occurred somewhere after the time the angels were created and before he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden. Whether Satan's fall occurred hours, days, or years before he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden, scripture does not say. Why did Satan fall from heaven? Satan fell because of pride. He desired to be God, not to be a servant of God. Notice the many, I will, statements in Isaiah chapter 14 verses 12 to 15. Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 12 to 15 describes Satan as an exceedingly beautiful angel. Satan was likely the highest of all angels, the anointed cherub, the most beautiful of all of God's creations, but he was not content in his position. Instead, Satan desired to be God, to essentially kick God off his throne and take over the rule of the universe. Satan wanted to be God, and interestingly enough, that desire is what Satan tempted Adam and Eve with in the Garden of Eden as we see in Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 to 5. How did Satan fall from heaven? Actually, a fall is not an accurate description. It would be far more accurate to say God cast Satan out of heaven, as we see in Isaiah chapter 14 verse 15 and Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 16 to 17. Satan did not fall from heaven, rather, Satan was pushed out of heaven. Satan is the hallmark of rebellion in the kingdom of God. Now let me tell you what he has been doing since then. His moves have always been oriented towards thwarting God's move. Throughout the known history, we see that he has a definite handicap, 
and that is making a mockery of himself. He does not know the future actions to be done by God, so, he makes his move after understanding how he has been played on. One of such post-event tantrums is called Islam. He had absolutely no clue that Jesus would come this way. So when Jesus came to the scene, he had to stop the apple cart. So what did he do? He took the chief priests and the Roman rulers to his own side, not knowing that this was the entire plan of God in which he is also a participant. And then, when he saw that Jesus did rise from the grave, rewarding immortality and redemption to humanity, his two blights started getting the connection. Now that he has arrived late at the party not knowing that he is the villain, he tries to pop up heresies within the Christian church. However, he understood that it is not going to make many inroads within the church, as the leaders had built up strong walls to resist those heresies. The warning of the Lord Jesus Christ that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church was enough for them to understand that the gates of hell shall be unleashed against them. The heresies that rose within the, the early church was dealt in a very unified manner by identifying the culprits, exposing the error, and promptly excommunicating them from the church. Understand the pattern. Do you remember the verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9, What has been will be again, what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. The rebellion was started in the kingdom of God in heaven, and the same thing was instigated in the church of God on this earth. The name of the game is rebellion. Now let me turn your attention to a prophecy by our Lord Jesus. The prophecy is in the form of a parable. Matthew chapter 13 verse 24 to 30 is famously known as the parable of the weeds. Let me read it for you. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then our Lord goes on to explain what he meant by the parable. You don't need any complex parable decryption logic, it is plain before our eyes. Let me read the meaning of the parable from the same chapter verse 36 to 43. Please listen carefully. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Please pay attention to the verse in Matthew chapter 13 verse 25. The servants, who were expected to be on guard, got sleepy, and they did indeed sleep off. There was a time when the Christian church got too much involved in power politics of the Roman Empire and went into a spiritual slumber. This happened probably a century after the Roman Emperor Constantine became a Christian and then it gave ample time for the devil to sow his seeds into the Christian church. Moreover, he chose a place which was weak in resistance to such heresies to start his operations. If you are liking our content, please do not forget to press the like button, and if you have not yet subscribed to our channel, please do so and do press the bell icon to be notified of all our future uploads. Now let me continue about the rise of a heretic cult within Christianity, and later became a religion by itself. There is no reason for me to accept the Islamic history that is being propagated by Muslims. Why should I? Should I not investigate non-Islamic historical sources too? We know that history is always written by the victorious ones. Therefore, 
Isn't it natural for me to embellish and even lie about the history of my tribe, my religion, or my country when I am the writer of the history book? Wouldn't I take extra care to smoothen the sharp edges and present an acceptable history? When I looked into non-Islamic sources for the life of Muhammad and the rise of Islam, I found something which is not in line with the standard Islamic narrative which our friend Yasser Qadi accepts as having holes within it. Every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. Okay, this is what I'm going to say. So let us now move forward and try to fix pieces of this jigsaw puzzle called Islam that we Christians know as a religion. I have studied few other religions in my life apart from Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. I know quite a bit of Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism too. Islam is the only religion which focuses on another religion as the base of itself. Without Christianity and Judaism, Islam will become irrelevant and non-existent. Whereas all the other religions can live in their own spaces without being so bound by the doctrines and beliefs of other religions. For example, even though Buddhism and Jainism borrows quite some of the theological constructs from Hinduism, they do not have any binding with Hinduism that would threaten their existence without the existence of Hinduism. Let me explain to you with this simple verse from the Quran. Surah 5 verse 82 says the following. You are sure to find that the most hostile to the believers are the Jews and those who associate other deities with God. You are sure to find that the closest in affection towards the believers are those who say, We are Christians, for there are among them people devoted to learning and ascetics. These people are not given to arrogance. Wow, quite flattering. Don't be so excited. I will give you another verse which says the exact opposite from the very same chapter of the Quran. Surah 5 verse 18 says the following. And from those who say, We are Christians, we took their covenant, but they forgot a portion of that of which they were reminded. So we caused among them animosity and hatred until the day of resurrection. And Allah is going to inform them about what they used to do. In one verse, the Quran says that the Christians are nice and loving people, and in another verse of the same chapter, this same Allah says that he will cause animosity and hatred within them till the day of resurrection. Now this is just a sample. The Quran is filled with hundreds of verses which speaks about Christians, Jesus, Moses, Jews, Mary, and so much more. Remove the figures and people who belong to other religions from the Quran, and I tell you that the Quran will shrink by 50%. If half of your religion is directly depending on the existence of another religion, what exactly is your religion? Think about it. Islam does not have an existence without Christianity and Judaism. In short, when Satan could not push his heresy into mainline Christianity, he created a pseudo-religion as prophesied in Matthew chapter 13. Even more interesting is that, we have enough evidence with us now which shows that Christ Jesus was the focal point of early Islam. Islam wanted to distort Jesus and present a totally different picture about him. Reading through the Quran and removing all junk, we will find a skeleton which is absolutely Jesus-centric, I mean focusing on projecting a wrong picture of Jesus Christ. As most Muslims now think and operate, Muhammad is never a name, it is a title. Muhammad simply means praised one. While we read the Bible, we come across a phrase called, the Holy One. This is a title we ascribe to God. It is not the name of God. Similarly, the term praised one is a title ascribed to an individual. It's never a name. As a majority of Muslims are non-Arabs now, they are led to believe that the name of the Prophet of Islam was Muhammad. Unfortunately, this is a lie they have been believing. It's time we help them in correcting it. Muhammad the praised one was originally a Syriac, Aramaic title for Jesus. During the earlier 3rd and 4th century, Arabian language was in a nascent state, while Aramaic was a much more developed language. I repeat, in the pre-Nicene Syrian Christian church, Jesus Christ was the praised one, meaning Jesus was Muhammad. Look at this Syriac script, which is what was mentioned for Jesus as Muhammad in all earlier Syrian Christian churches. And later, when Arabic came into the scene, this is how Muhammad is written. It's almost the same, in all probability, Arabic script came out as a progeny of Syriac, Aramaic. The Arabia, as we know now, was a hotbed of anti-Trinitarian Arabic Christians. 
it took some time before it became a full-fledged new religion we know now as Islam. Now let us investigate on some historical artifacts and see how strong the Islamic narrative is. According to Islamic narrative, the first caliphate empire of Islam was called the Rashidun Caliphate. It had four caliphs, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. After that came the Umayyad Caliphate. According to Islamic sources, Muawiyah I was the founder and first caliph of the Umayyad Caliphate, ruling from 661 until his death. He became caliph less than 30 years after the death of the Islamic prophet Muhammad and immediately after the four Rashidun caliphs. Now that we have heard the Islamic narrative, let us see what we get as proof for that. Hamid Gator. This is an inscription of 663 AD. It reads, End the days of Abd Allah, servant of God. Muawiyah, the commander of the faithful, the hot baths of the people there, were saved and rebuilt by Abd Allah son of Abwasemos, Abu Hashim, the counselor, on the fifth of the month of December, the second day of the sixth year of the indiction, in the year 726 of the colony, according to the Arabs the forty-second year, for the healing of the sick, under the care of Joannes, the official of Gadara. The year quoted here corresponds to the year 663 AD. Notice that this is the first attestation of the Arab calendar, and there is absolutely no mention of the Hijra, which our Muslim friends start their calendar with. Before we move further, I would like my viewers to look at the very first character of the inscription. This is not a Greek alphabet, but a symbol used by the king to display his belief. Who do you think will display a cross as his symbol other than a Christian to confess his belief? The Middle East had different kind of Christian beliefs, which proved as a reason for the rise of the anti-Trinitarian culture. In the meanwhile Muawiyah failed in an attempt to annex Byzantine, and opposition to him grew and consolidated together. In the year 672, Abd Allah ibn al-Zubair was declared as the commander of the faithful. This is what we get from the coins that was minted in that year. We understand that in spite of huge pressure, Muawiyah continued to be the ruler till 681 AD when Abdal Malik takes over from him. Abdal Malik was an anti-Trinitarian Christian. He demanded that all Christians in the Arabian lands be united under one banner. Abdal Malik is the one who propagated the understanding of Jesus as Muhammad. He also propagated the idea that Jesus was Abdallah, meaning Jesus was the servant of God. The confession of the Muhammad title for Jesus can be found in many dated and undated coins of that era. Trinitarian Christianity is the one whose doctrines equate Jesus as the Son of God with the same essence as that of the Father. Now if somebody wants to continue to elevate Jesus but at the same time does not want to accept him as God the Son, what would he do? He would keep insisting that Jesus is the praised one meaning Muhammad and that Muhammad is the prophet of God. This is exactly how the Islamic Shahada got evolved from anti-Trinitarian Christian beliefs. Look at this coin in which it says, It is Abdal Malik, the commander of believers, a man with no weaknesses, from whom rebels can expect no indulgence, on the one who defies him falls his whip. And on the reverse side, we see a transformed cross with three steps leading to the cross. We know that Islam forbids human images, but here we have Abdal Malik coins with his image. It took some time till he removed his picture on the coins and replaced it with Quran writings. This is how anti-Trinitarian Christianity gradually became Islam. Look at these coins, we can see crosses on it, and remember that these are minted by Islamic caliphs. How can they be minting these kinds of cross coins which is anti-Islamic for them? So what do we understand from this evidence we have with us? Islam continued to be evolved and defined as newer caliphs came into the scene. One thing they missed out removing from their doctrine is the term Messiah. They keep calling Jesus as Messiah, not realizing that Messiah must be the Savior who saves people from their sins, and if Messiah saves people from their sins, there is no scope for Islam to be the Savior. Just as prophesied by Jesus in the parable of the weeds, the seeds of tares which Satan sowed into the field of God started growing, and now it has filled the whole field. It will continue till the time of the harvest when our Lord Jesus tells his angels to first pull out these tares before harvesting the wheat. I would like to conclude this episode at this point. If you like this channel, please do recommend it to your friends and family. 
Also do subscribe the channel and click on the bell icon for instant updates. We will discuss further about the Clash of the Kingdoms in our future episodes. Till then may the good Lord bless you and keep you.